Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. Jason Hartman has helped thousands of people realize their dreams of financial independence through real estate investing. And now he's got an unbeatable offer for you. He's offering you his proven course that thousands have used to build an income property empire. And it's free to the first 100 Financial Survival Network listeners. Just go to jasonhartman.com slash Lutz and sign up today for cash flow and capital appreciation, there's nothing else like it. Make your money work as hard as you do by building an income property empire. Real estate is America's proven investment. Go to jasonhartman.com slash Lutz and get your free course today. That's Jason, H-A-R-T-M-A-N.com slash Lutz. Thousands have paid nearly $300 for this course, but for this short period of time, you can get it free. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network.com. I'm Kerry Lutz on 1230 WBZT. It, can you believe it? It's been five years since Lehman collapsed. Have we learned a damn thing? I don't think so. And neither does the person you're about to hear from, Danielle Park. Danielle, welcome back to the Financial Survival Network. How you doing? Hey, Carrie. Happy Labor Day weekend. Back to the fall and down to down to business. Yeah, back to the salt mines, as it were. So, <laughs> yeah. so what do you think? It's been five years and too big to fail, too big to bail, too big to jail. It's all going just fine, right? Yeah, we've heard we've heard all of that for sure, and um, it's it's remarkable that it has been able to chug along uh, in some ways. Certainly, some of the uh, asset markets have chugged along much longer than you know I certainly would have thought possible given the very tenuous underpinnings and weak structure and the just the filth in the system that still remains because nothing was cleansed in the last big blow up so there's you know it's remarkable that QE has really um, sort of jiggered things along this this period of time but I really think you know it goes back to the whole tapering in the, in September issue, and I I've disagreed. You and I have disagreed for some time on this. I do think the taper's coming. I do think that the Fed is at the end of its rope in terms of how much more credit it can extend into these uh, asset markets, or at least justify. And certainly, with recent economic data looking sort of tempered, there's every political reason to justify them tapering. And uh, you know. That, I think, is, is going to bring the next period of price discovery or uh, at least reveal some, um, some actual organic support where it may lie for many of these asset markets. Because the disconnect, you know, the real economy already collapsed, carry it collapsed in 2008-9. The stock market was reflecting that for a period of time. Then a certain sectors of it got free handouts out of the Fed Reserve and, and various central banks. Some people have have rolled that up but the overall populace and the overall economy continues to feel the weight of the of the uh, the recession that was and i don't think it's going to make it a, a lot of difference to them when asset prices r- reflect the truth i mean the re- as i say most people already know the economy's bad uh it's bubble vi- vision and and some participants that have been you know pumping stocks up in this period are trying to convince everyone otherwise, but most people really do know and feel the truth about where economic growth is. And so things like the spike in interest rates over the last few months as the taper talk started, that's been huge. You know, that that's, a, that's like an 80% increase in borrowing costs for the government just in the last four months, or it's a 40% increase in the 30-year fixed mortgage in the U.S. just, you know, since this time last year. I mean, goes across the board. And this is coming at a time when the economy, people, households, companies, governments, most indebted ever in human history. I mean, businesses owe more today than they did in 2007. You know, not not only is it just student debt that's much higher today than it was in 2007, but, you know, corporations and most households, when you add on all the types of debt, have more debt today than they did back then. So there's just less buffer built in now, and I think more likelihood that truth will finally come out. 
Yeah, well, you see rates are headed higher. I mean, 2.86 today on the 10-year. And interestingly enough, gold and silver prices also headed higher. Yeah, you've certainly seen a bounce in, in gold and silver. And, you know, the trend needs to break out considerably still to mark a new expansionary phase. It's still, you know, much lower than it was in 2011, as you know. Um, so we'll see. Uh, if if there is a... You know, right now, there's so many cross signals, right? There's the whole Syrian debacle and whether or not that's li- likely to be stimulative for the U.S. economy or not or... You know, you've got oil at the same time at a two and a half year high, which is essentially a tax on the real economy. Um, you've got all this, uh, you know, um, debate about what kind of economic data we're seeing. In the one hand, you get one reading one week that shows, shows a, a decelerating trend, and the next week you see something that suggests maybe there is some demand. You know, new orders was better today, but this this back and forth, um, I think, is overshadowed by the fact that weak demand prevails in the world and that we're still at stall speed and below. If you look at nominal GDP, for example, for the U.S. economy, we're still well below the 3.7%, which is considered sort of break-even. And so I still think recessionary bias remains. I think taper is, is coming. I think that it'll take another big asset crisis for anyone to start trying to think of new ways to stimulate. And all of that is likely to... um, to play out, you know, in the next several months, let's say. It could be that we've already started. I mean, the high was something like May, and and we're on the downside here. And and gold and silver in that environment will either act as a safe haven where people rush to that, as they have been doing a bit in the the last couple of months. Or, you know, my my big concern, and, and this is as a portfolio manager, who studied all about diversification theory and, you know, uh, international diversity, asset class diversity, how you sort of offset risks in a portfolio. My number one complaint in this environment has been correlations are high. So it might be that you get some safe haven status in things like the precious metals, but in 08 we saw a pretty dramatic drop in them as well. And the risk here is that you have the most over-levered participants since 07 and since 2000 in terms of margin use and you know um, just less net equity in, in the people that are participating in these markets. So once you get selling, it goes everywhere and it goes across the board and it cascades from one to another and pretty much everything gets thrown out with the baby in the bathwater. So it, it's a very dangerous climate for capital and it's a very dangerous climate for people that sort of look at portfolio theory as this you know, well, obviously this and obviously that. I think there's not a lot that's real obvious here except extreme overpricing, extreme over leverage, and we know how those things typically have concluded in history, and it's always with a sort of a big washout in prices to the downside. No doubt. But what about housing? Now, if this taper is for real, which I'm still not convinced. I mean, the Fed always uh, plays, talks a good game, and in the and the only thing they really do is inflate, but let's just assume that they're really going to ca- taper. What's, what's that going to do to housing? I mean, I always thought the housing was a fake, a fake boom lit anyway, because they're restricting supply and they're boosting demand with artificially low interest rates. And they had a number of ways that they restricted supply by selling off the Fannie Freddie FHA inventory to hedge funds, keeping, um, you know, using their leverage with the banks to keep inventory off the markets and getting the banks to to sell to hedge funds. A lot of ways that they've kept the supply off the market. What's going to happen to this uh, nascent housing boom once they start to taper? Well, again, you have the financialization trying to dictate and dominate the real economy. And what we saw in the last couple of years in housing has certainly been a lot of cash buying, a lot of hedge funds, and as you say, people coming in and investing in housing as a as an asset class, turning around and basically renting it out or doing whatever they can to make a financial profit. But it doesn't really speak to the the, the meat of the matter, which is the average working person who, you know, the young people who need to buy a first-time home off of someone else who's trying to move up uh, into a larger, better 
home. Um, we don't have any of that organic demand. That mechanism's really broken because of the fact that, you know, boomers are overly indebted and, and should have been out of debt years ago but aren't. And then you've got the young people behind them underemployed and not with sufficient wealth to buy those houses. And so you've got, uh, again, this disconnect between what was going on in, as an investment investment market in housing and what's going on in the real world. What you do need, though, is you need you can't have everybody being a cash buyer. Clearly, that's a finite set of, of funds and people that are willing to do that. And they're also not buying housing for using it, per se, as they are as an investment, which means they expect it to go up. And if you get a stagnant um, period, uh, which I think could be brought on now by that simple stat that I said, where you've got a 40% borrowing cost increase, in the U.S. mortgage market in one year. That's dramatic. I mean, people who talk about, oh, well, rates are still relatively low or rates have only gone up a percent. The 10-year yield was 1.6 and it's only gone up you know, just over a percent since then. Really missed the mark completely. We're talking about relative price increase. So that's, you know, when, when someone's used to carrying, um, you know, a, a mortgage at 3% and it goes to 4 that's that big change in your in your carrying costs and your price. So that that really I think is is the dominant um, influence here, and it makes me think you can't get do- like double digit pops in in prices on a on a you know quarter over quarter basis or year over year basis is always a sign of something that's a fleeting trend, not a constantly uh, predictable thing. So I think that we're likely to see at least a slow period for housing. But very likely we'll have to back and fill and give back some of these gains that have come in the last couple of years, again, basically due to artificial demand rather than end user demand. Okay. And another thing that shows me that the trend is not good for home buying, they're starting to push adjustable rate mortgages again. That's never a good sign for home buying. And, you know, uh, something that comes to mind um, is to gently to that is that the U.S. dollar strength. So, you know, everyone's been talking about how the U.S., the S&P has dramatically outperformed emerging markets, the Canadian market, basically every other stock market in the last year. And if you chart them together, which we do frequently and have done in our, our recent month-end letter for clients, you see this huge gap between what the S&P 500 company share prices have been doing and what the rest of the world and the rest of the markets have been doing. And um, I think that gap is, is something that will inevitably reconcile to the downside because really once you've already priced in perfection and priced in double-digit housing expectation gains into the U.S. economy as a main, you know, a main stool of your platform for why you think the, the recovery is only picking up steam from here, then you factor in things like the U.S. dollar index bottomed at 73 and is now above 82 on its way to a key resistance around 85. That's all very bad for S&P 500 profits. You know, they, they've they had this remarkable period of profitability because they had such low labor costs and low taxation rates and, you know, they were able to do set aside FASB accounting, fair disclosure. Like, they've had every possible, you know, rule bent their way in the last couple of years. And now you've got weak demand in the world and stronger dollar, not weaker dollar, stronger dollar, which makes it very difficult for them to find any sort of quick um, addition, you know, keep up that pace of profit growth. And again, that goes back to, well, do you mean U.S. companies are, are, there's no good value there? No, they could be great franchises. But again, if I'm paying 30% more than they're worth based on this artificial period we've just been through, then that's very likely to be a bad investment. And I think that's the thing that people have to understand. The price that you pay is everything to do with how you fare in that vehicle over time. You're absolutely right, Danielle. And uh, we're going to talk more about that up next on the FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. I'm Kerry Lutz with Danielle Park on 1230 WBZT. Our friend Tom Dyson at the Palm Beach Letter is giving away free copies of a really cool report he put together called How to Protect Yourself from America's New Secret Police. Inside, you'll learn all sorts of simple, everyday tricks you can use to make yourself a little less visible and vulnerable to scammers, hackers, and even the federal government. For instance, inside Tom's report, you'll learn 
which free internet email service never to use. This company doesn't care if your account gets hacked or not. Four things the government must tell you if they request your social security number. And how to spot skimmers lying in wait on ATMs and gas pumps and much, much more. These tricks and secrets are low-hanging fruit ideas. You don't have to invest time or much money into them. Most are free. But by taking some basic measures, you can make your privacy much harder to invade than your neighbors. Tom's report is available for a limited time to listeners who take a trial subscription to his newsletter. Just visit the Financial Survival Network homepage for more information or go to www.palmbeachletter2.com. That's www palm beach letter the number two dot com we're back financial survival network.com carrie lutz talking about the real economy with danielle park on twelve thirty wbzt so danielle you know we're talking values we're talking real economy we're talking reality which is something that you know and i know that wall street the politicians around the world, very few people really want to face, whether it's about the economy, whether it's about your health, whether it's about what your kids are really doing, whether it's about the state of your financial affairs, whatever. So many things, it's just so easy to put it off and just not come to terms with it. I mean, you know it, I know it. And yet, eventually, if you don't come to terms with it, it's going to come to terms with you. And you seem to be of the opinion that Summers is going to be the new Fed chairman. It's not going to be Yellen. And he's uh, he's a big taper guy. And he's just going to put the screws to the economy. So if he does that, then clearly we're going to see a huge takedown of the Dow and of financial markets not just in the United States, but around the world, right? Well, you would think so. Now, I don't have a lot of confidence or faith in Mr. Summers as a leader, but I do think that he's more ornery and less inclined to be a consensus builder and a team. You know, I think they clearly want to have... My my own impression is that they tried QE. It was an experiment. They ran to the fences with it, and now they realize... I mean, everyone that spoke at Jackson Hole in Wyoming in August talked about the risks and the problems that came from QE and the disappointments on the growth side. The San Francisco Fed, Janet Yellen's own alma mater, published a paper last month talking about how disappointing the actual impacts to the real economy have been. So it seems to me that they definitely want a reason or an excuse to signal a change of policy. They want to say, we tried all that, we meant, we, you know, we gave it the very best, but it just hasn't panned out the way that we theorized or hoped. And so they want someone who will now signal a new direction. I think by putting in um, Ms. Yellen, you know, they, there would be an expectation because she's worked so closely with Bernanke and with Greenspan that you just have more of the same, and nobody really wants that. So they are going to try and recast it. This is like the the big bath syndrome in corporations, where the corporation's been going in the wrong direction, and what they do is they throw out the CEO and bring in a new person who pr- professes an entirely new approach. Um, I think that that's why Summers may indeed be getting the most in the voting poll at the moment because they so desperately want a good excuse to break with that path that they've been on for the last three years. And, you know, he's been a big um, advisor to the financial services industry and his tentacles in government and financial services. It's still repulsive. It's the same old, same old we see in pretty much every revolving door person we've seen come in and out of government and back into the to the financial sector. So I don't have a lot of um, hope in, in that sense, but I do think that he is he's likely to be the poster child for this new policy move, and the fact is nobody knows yet what that policy initiative will be because they've only had the one idea for the last 30 years, Carrie, and it was credit expansion. Well, credit expansion has now officially run its course, zero rates and then taper for three years and still a very weak economy, and a and balance sheet that's nearing $4 trillion for the Federal Reserve. So, and by the way, 
is suffering losses in terms of the, the spike in rates. Don't kid ourselves. That's in, that's impacting the assets on the fa- balance sheet of the Federal Reserve as well. As rates go up, those assets go down. And they used to be this very short liquid portfolio, and in the last three years they've you know, heavily added to the longer dated aspect of their balance sheet. And that's exactly where those uh, hits come in terms of uh, your capital loss when rates rise. So they're, they've really painted themselves into a corner. And I think that even if the economy, you know, just muddles along here, I think the different the difficulty is that gap, as I mentioned, between the reality of the real economy, what's been going on in the rest of the world markets and emerging markets, and what's happened with this QE-inspired faith in, um, in the S&P, as an example, in the Dow. So that's where the greatest price risk is today. The greatest price risk is also in you know, the intersensitive sectors, the REITs, the utilities, the pharmaceuticals, everything that people have bought on this idea that one could just reach for more yield and it would be, it would all work out. And I think, you know, the fact is that, that that's where um, the likelihood of great capital losses are ahead. And that's unfortunately where many people have sort of herded themselves uh, in the last few years. And it goes back to, as, as you mentioned, you know, do you want to know the truth or do you want to believe something that might feel good for a while but will ultimately hurt you? And given those choices, I always think it's best to deliver the truth, to live with the facts, to try and adjust our behavior as we go, than to put ourselves in uh, in some, you know, hope-induced coma that ends up in a catastrophic event. Because we really can't escape reality. We can pretend it's not what it is, but I always find... It's, it's better to be awake and alive and defensive in what you're doing than just, you know, snoozing and, and uh, have everything take you by surprise. Because let's not forget, I mean, I had a quote in our, in our letter that to clients this week, this week uh, just, you know, Yellen as an example, none of those Fed heads, none of those economists ever see a downturn coming. And, and we'll happily admit that, that they missed the entire financial crisis, didn't see any of it coming. So we can't look to them for any help in, moder- in, in sort of monitoring our own personal risk as we go along. And like you said, it's the same as health issues. I see health and financial as exactly the same. You know, you can take a pill for a while if, if you think, you know, that might moderate the symptoms, but ultimately it comes back to what your basic habits are. And you're the one that's best equipped to monitor your risk and to control your risk that way. And it's always in the choices you make, who you choose to associate with, who you choose to take your advice from. You know, do you, do you uh, look for a quick fix or are you prepared to deal with reality? Yeah, I think you summed it up quite well. And really, yeah, the company you keep is that uh, old commercial used to say. And, and this thing's coming. And I don't know if they're just prepared, though, to see this thing fall 10,000 points really relatively quickly. Um, And will the money go rushing back into treasuries when the market starts to fall, though, Danielle? Will people just blindly put it there for safety? It has been uh, in in traditional safe havens. It's been flowing out of equities. It's been flowing out of high-yield instruments. Um, that's why we've seen things like the REITs and, and the, um, the S&P was off nearly 5% just in August alone, carry. So yeah. it, from, peak, from its peak to, to the low at the end of the month. So I think that the, the capital is flowing out. It's going into things like cash deposits. It's going into the U.S. dollar, clearly. I think you've seen some redemptions by countries in stress, which is places like China and India have been selling some of their reserves. Now, many people will say that's because they've lost faith in the, uh, in the U.S. government or the U.S. debt issues, I actually disagree. I think it's because they're in quite a bit of stress in their domestic economy. I mean, the rupee's been in a free fall. Oh, yeah. The, the Chinese economy had a slightly higher PMI, um, which was considered uh, more optimistic this morning. But ultimately, they have massive problems in their credit system. They have big problems in their wage pressure within their economy. Uh, so I think that they're they're not selling as much to the world as they were. They're not. It's like every other business where you have a big drop off in cash flow. You know, suddenly you have to start liquidating some of your own savings or pumping out more debt. But they've already done that, right? The debt in the Chinese yeah. economy is like oh, top, yeah. it's above subprime debt issues in the United States. I mean, it's 
It's huge. So when you're faced with that, what you do is you start liquidating some money, bringing it back home. Same with the European crisis. You know, they have a lot of strains in their in their income statement. Uh, so they're bringing capital home. They have to repatriate that back into their currency. But even with those things going on in three of those largest economic areas outside of the United States, you're still seeing support for the U.S. dollar coming in. And uh, I think we're heading into another, as you know, standoff about the whole debt fiasco in, in uh, September. I don't know how that's going to resolve itself in the usual antics, probably. Um, but <laughs> With the usual that, suspects. Basically, though, you've got tapering coming. You've got a standoff about the debt, which will get resolved in more spending, no doubt. But these are sort of things that are pulling on this. Uh, idea that the government can print and print and print and I think it's starting to reverse that as a, as a model in which case that's supportive for the US dollar that's supportive for yeah. the US treasuries probably for a while longer here and it's negative for things that have you know extrapolated these insane growth trends into the into infinity infinity well let's talk about important things here Danielle on uh, September 10th new announcement from apple new iphone coming so you know you can rest easy that apple is going to have new products coming out so whatever else is blowing up in the world at least apple's gonna gonna be okay they're gonna get through it so don't worry and as far as those chinese numbers go you know forget about it you can't believe any of them their numbers are as specious as any number that the u.s government puts out All government numbers are instantly suspect and just forget about them because they're just garbage. And hey, hey, by the way, I watched uh, I watched Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead. I sent it out to a number of people who definitely need it. I'm not going to quite concede that juicing is the answer to uh, all of one's health problems. But I will concede that if you're overweight, losing weight certainly is a major part of the puzzle and how however you have to go about losing weight you have to do it because if you don't you're just taking years off of your life needlessly to eat crap and there's just no reason for it because you've been conditioned you've been sold a bill of goods and and then once you get fat then the pharmaceutical companies big pharma owns you for the rest of your life which isn't going to be that long so watch that movie it's very powerful and combines the it's just amazing i'm really thankful to you for turning me on to that Uh, thank you i i think it's a fabulous documentary and um i it's it's a gift that keeps on giving because there's many more documentaries like similar themes that i Mm -hmm. actually i've got them on my blog under on juggling dynamite under recommended people can go there there's a whole tab of health and i've got a bunch of links trailers movies and and books that i think are useful on this point but one thing i've noticed is it's true that if people can get the weight off really it's it's a it's a benefit and there's many different ways people go about it but the thing that i think is the most um, concerning is that a lot of these weight loss places like you know weight watchers or jenny craig or whatever the, what they do is they sell people these frozen dead food packs. crap crap they portion control to make them lose calorie to, to diminish calorie and lose weight i get yeah. it but it doesn't teach them anything about how to continue in a healthful manner it doesn't teach them no. how to feed themselves or their family that dead frozen food full of salt and sodium and sauces and chemicals it's portion controlled but it's not it's the opposite of the food you need to be eating and what i love about juicing is it's so simple because people mm-hmm. will say well i'm not a gourmet chef or i don't have a lot of time or you know i i don't know what to do with an eggplant well you know what neither do i i just stick it in my juicer because <laughs> that's quick fast fresh and i can't hey. go wrong and you know it's just it's a it's a it's the solution to the fast-paced world we live in where people have yeah. very little time and ability to cook and if they can just get their hands on live food and put it through this a juicer or a smoothie at least they're giving themselves live microbiotic food and they're not buying you know well, profits to these companies selling them the frozen dead food hey well i found this like really great thing that anybody can eat and it's really simple it's called a salad and you just throw a bunch of stuff in there and you eat it and it pretty much covers everything but 
but seriously, um, had this guy on, retired doctor, Richard Ruling, in his 70s, perfect health. I don't think he's got an ounce of fat on his body. Having a little bit of fat is not such a bad thing. But he told me, all right, pharmacology isn't really the study of drugs. It's actually toxicology, which is the study and control of poisons. All drugs taken long term is your body treats it as a poison. Okay, it's good in the short term. Eventually, your body treats it as a poison. And it's all about the study of maintaining poisons in your body. And I'm telling you, Danielle, I'm like virtually off of all the poisons that my body was taken. And the other point that Richard Ruling makes is that every country that practices Western medicine is bankrupt. Do you think that's a coincidence, Danielle? Every no, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's such a wasteful system. Yeah, right? and every and every uh, country that has a Western diet and also has Western medicine, guess what? They're bankrupt. Now, why is that, Danielle? Ever stop and think why that is? I don't want to get too carried away here. We are the financial survival network. We're not the physical, you know, whip your body into shape network. There's people that do that stuff a lot better than me. I'm a Johnny come it's lately. Totally connected. Yeah, That's the exactly. Thing. It's totally connected. Your financial health is, is a major exactly. impact. If your health is in the toilet, and I, you know, I yeah. heard some um, actress saying a while ago, and she was very heavy, and you know, they were asking her if she uh, had any flack for being so heavy, and she said, you know, I don't, sm- I don't, I just, I'm very busy. I'm raising my kids. I'm having a great career, and I don't sweat the small stuff. And the first thing I thought of is, but that's not the small <laughs> stuff. Your health is actually yeah. the foundation of your life. And the money you're pouring into drugs mm-hmm. every month and, you know, diminished capacity and, and um, yes. energy costs you on every possible level and certainly financially. And certainly the medical system uh, can't support the financial cost of all mm-hmm. that. So, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's not like it's, it's absolutely connected. Totally agree with you. And, uh, and thank you for that, uh, that movie. I encourage everyone to watch it because... Yeah, that guy was driving a truck. He was 430 pounds, and he was on the uh, high-speed expressway to the graveyard, and he definitely hated his job, hated what he was doing every day. He hated his life, right? He felt terrible physically and emotionally, and every way felt like the walking dead. Yep, absolutely. So uh, there's no reason you should be feeling that way. No reason you have to. And uh, the amount of energy I have now, the... uh, ways in which my life's changed just amazing i encourage you to do the same but like i say not to belabor the point but just do something about it stop sitting back on your on your couch watching tv watching whatever the latest so-called reality tv is just get up and do something about it take a walk whatever it takes just do something danielle we'll talk to you in a couple weeks um and uh Enjoy the rest of the uh, the good weather up there because you aren't going to have it for much longer. Oh, the nights are getting cool and the mornings are dark. It's coming, <laughs> Carrie. I can feel it. Yeah, anyway, well, thank you. Okay, you be well. Bye. Hi, it's Carrie Lutz. I recently decided to move my retirement account into physical precious metals to hedge against the coming times. If you want to move an existing retirement account into physical precious metals that you can hold in your hand tax-free, there's no company that can do it more quickly and efficiently than Regal Assets. It took them just 24 hours to open my new IRA account, and all I had to do was fill out one simple form. The best part is that Regal Assets does all the work for you. They cover the setup and administrative costs for 2013. If you're interested in making the same move I did, call 855-678-6620-855-678-6620. That's 855-678-6620 or visit them at regalassets.com. You'll be glad you did and tell them Carrie sent you. The Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network.